someone asked the Rebbe, why do Jews always answer a question with a question? And the Rebbe replied, and why shouldn't they answer a question with a question? <laughs> According to Jewish tradition, the custom of the people becomes the halakha, it becomes the path or even the law. So if it's a custom for Jews to answer a question with a question, it can become even halakha if it meets one condition. It has to be done for the sake of trying to live up to what we believe God wants of us. The Talmud has a phrase for this, pokhazi. Pokhazi is the principle of go out and see. Go out and see what the people are doing. The thing about customs is that they change and they are different from place to place. In ancient Israel, according to this week's Torah portion, which is entitled Tzav, which means command, as we heard, but Cantor Adi also taught me that it can mean connection, which I think is just beautiful. The Israelites drew close to God through the sacrifice of animals. Today, we don't sacrifice animals. We have other rituals for drawing near to God, like lighting Shabbat candles, putting our arms around each other at the end of a service when we sing O Se Shalom. For many of these, we say a blessing that includes these words, Asher Kichanu B'mitzvotav V'tzivanu. Asher Kichanu, who makes us holy. Asher Kichanu B'mitzvotav, makes us holy with commandments. And V'tzivanu, commands us to light the Shabbat candles, for example, to engage in the study of Torah. It's a tradition for rabbis, and for tonight we get to include rabbinical students, to poke hazi, to go out and see what Jews are doing all over the world and report back to their communities. You might at some point have come across a text that said something like, it's the custom of the Jews of Yemen to make matzah that is soft rather than firm, or the Jews of Hungary lay out their jewels and their finest possessions at the Passover Seder to remind themselves of the gifts that the Egyptians gave the Israelites. I recently took a trip, and I want to share with you what I saw. This past December, I joined other rabbinical and cantorial students on a trip sponsored by the Joint Distribution Committee uh, to visit Jewish communities in India. The JDC is a leading humanitarian organization, Jewish humanitarian organization. It began in 1914 to help the Jews who are suffering hunger in Hungary and in what we now call Israel. Our group visited two cities, Kochi, which is in the southwest, and Mumbai, which is India's largest city. In Kochi, only two Jews remain, and they're both in their 80s, but it once had a population of four to 5,000 Jews. Most of the Jews in Kochi have moved to the Negev in southern Israel, where their community thrives to this day. This was confirmed when the Israeli students on our trip sent us after the trip pictures of the communities in the Negev that they visited, and the synagogue there looks exactly like the synagogues that we were in in India, which we filled with our voices in song and in prayer. There are two different populations of Jews in India, the Paradisi, whose ancestors migrated from Portugal after they were expelled from Portugal in the late 15th century, and the B'nai Israel community, which, get this, they date themselves back to the time of King Solomon, who sent a group of Israelites to collect treasures, peacock feathers and ivory to bring back to the temple. And this group, it, before it was discovered by modern Jews, they celebrated a lot of Jewish holidays. They said the Shema and lots of prayers. There was one Jewish holiday they didn't celebrate, Purim, because it hadn't been invented at the time when they were thought to have left. <laughs> In Kochi, the jungle tussles with concrete. We visited four, five synagogues there, and four of them were cared for by dedicated non-Jews who were very excited to meet actual, real, live Jews. And rabbinical students, no less, though they were a little confused that some of us are women. <laughs> a few of the, there were a few 20-something-year-old uh, Indian uh, Jewish students who live in Mumbai and Pune, and they joined us in Kochi for our tours, and they co-led services with us, and they led a nusach, a set of melodies for the prayers that almost none of us had ever heard. I want to share with you just a couple of short vignettes from the trip. First, 
On the first night of Hanukkah, we went to the Gateway of India to celebrate. The Gateway of India is a huge monument built on the water to commemorate King George's landing in India in 1911. It's a very public place. I was surprised to find that the MC for the night was a Chabad rabbi with a Brooklyn accent. <laughs> no Jews of Indian descent participated in leading the event. When I asked about this, I learned there would be other events led by other Jewish communities, but they wouldn't be publicized because our trip leader explained Jews in India don't like to be very public about their Jewishness. There's no anti-Semitism, he assured me. It's just we like to fly under the radar. Some of the younger Jews felt differently and expressed so. They expressed a desire not to be so private. Second story. In the airport on the way from Kochi to Mumbai, I was shocked to see on the shelf of one of the bookstores facing us as we walked down the aisle a copy of Mein Kampf. I asked our tour guide, Joshua, he said, I got to tell you, Mein Kampf is a bestseller in India, but it's not because of anti-Semitism. People just think of Hitler as a great leader like Winston Churchill, and they want to learn from his book about how to be a great leader. But there's no anti-Semitism in India. Some of the younger members of the Indian community had something else to say. One of them said, it's awful, but we don't know what to do about it. No one knows about the Holocaust here. No one knows how it feels to see that book. And while the generations had different views about being publicly Jewish, they had in common a love for Israel. The younger Jews all felt drawn to, and some felt pressure to, take interest in Israel as a place to move, for the opportunity to live in a Jewish society, and for the economic opportunity. This both made me worry for the future of the Jewish community in India, and thank God for a strong and proud Israel that serves as a beacon for Jews all over the world. The trip reinforced the idea that just as for us here, Israel's existence and survival for the last 75 years is a source of pride even when her politics deeply upset us. Even more than for American Jews, Israel is understood as a refuge for Jewish communities around the world. Now, as we prepare to celebrate Passover during a perilous moment for Israel, we might focus our Seder conversations not just on how we gain freedom for those not yet free, but also how we maintain a free society when some seek power only for themselves. How we support publicly the existence of the state of Israel while engaging in a Zionism that does as Rabbi Jonathan described this past Rosh Hashanah, a Zionism that calls Israel to live up to the values that we teach, values of tikkun olam, of pursuing peace, of celebrating Jewish diversity and seeing the holy in all people, of putting that kind of Jewish back into the Jewish state. In particular, we can all do what our clergy asked of us in a message you might have received today, to keep speaking out about Israel needing to be a strong democracy with an independent judiciary. The Talmudic dictum Pokhazi tells us, go out and see how things are to help us understand how things should be. We go out and we see a rich array of Jewish practices all over the world. We see small Jewish communities and large ones strengthened by the existence of Israel. We see in our news feeds hundreds of thousands of Israelis marching in the streets to protect freedom and democracy. So I close tonight with a prayer for Israel from our High Holy Day prayer book. Source of our people's liberation, whose home is the human heart, Give strength and shelter to the state of Israel and its people, and to Zionists and Zion's friends in all countries. With love, nourish the saplings of the land and preserve its old growth. Bless the seeds of democracy planted by courageous pioneers. Bring to flower a good society, rooted in history and hope, made holy by its unceasing pursuit of justice, made strong by its vision of equality and human dignity. 
Let sweetness overwhelm sorrow, joy overcome despair. Source of peace. We pray for an oasis of peace, a home secure and safe, a wellspring of shalom for Israel, its neighbors, and all people. And we might say together, Amen. Shabbat Shalom.